Bitcoin will be worth $100 trillion as an entire market cap. And that will still be less than the entire bond market, the entire US stock market, and worldwide real estate. Think about that. I'm not even saying that it surpasses these assets. And people think I'm crazy. Bank of America worked out that at the peak of the last bull run, $93 million of cash infusion was pushing up the market price of Bitcoin by 1%. And 1% at the time was $11 billion on a $1.1 trillion market cap. That's a $1 in to $118 increase in the market cap. Okay, so welcome back to the Money Matters podcast. Many of you guys call me a little bit crazy when I say that I believe Bitcoin could hit $65 million before 2030. And those of you who do think I'm a little bit crazy, you might want to turn off the podcast right now because I am joined by a man who I believe could even be more bullish than myself. We're going to talk a little bit more about why British believes that Bitcoin could hit $5 million in the future. But I want to first start off somewhere by maybe triggering a few real estate investors. British HODL, why do you believe that people should sell their properties and homes for Bitcoin? Real estate has not managed to keep up with the promise of maintaining its price and value against inflation. It might have kept up against the consumer price index, but it's certainly not kept up against the amount of debasement that's happened in most places around the world, unless you've held prime real estate and most people have not held prime real estate so what they've had to do is take on a bunch of debt in order to try and maintain the value that they that they were promised that real estate would maintain and on top of that every generation has its own asset and the and the next generation's asset is not real estate you can't you can't continue the the price trajectory of real estate that's happened over the last 30 years for the next 30 years and expect no social unrest to happen so real estate's basically the juice has been squeezed. It's a great way to put it. Um, just there, you kind of mentioned uh, the prior generation's asset has been real estate. I've heard you in a, another interview talk about how the next big wealth creation asset that people can invest in is Bitcoin. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit more to that and why you believe Bitcoin is now the thing to invest in over real estate? Yeah, the only, the only reason people invest in real estate is because of the scarcity of real estate, even though they don't know, they might not know that word right off the bat. But the only reason you are investing in anything is because there's not enough of it and you're assuming that other people are going to want it and therefore the price is going to go up. Hence, the scarcity of it drives the value of it. Mm. So if you are investing in, in real estate and then you have this alternate, which is complete finality of scarcity eventually the value is going to go from whatever the val wherever the value was chasing scarcity to wherever the scarcity actually is and so the scarcity is actually in bitcoin and now it's getting institutionally adopted you know governmentally adopt uh, adopted and so you know the value will start moving at some point hmm. yeah that's a great point now, something else that I've seen you really beating the drum pretty hard about recently is trying to motivate people to get to one Bitcoin, do everything they can to get to that one Bitcoin. And, you know, that should be their sole focus right now. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit more to that and why you've kind of said in the past, the next couple of years could be somebody's last chance to get to that milestone? It's not could be. It is somebody's last chance to get to this milestone. You've got Bitcoin to me prices out people. When you have finality of scarcity, you are and and demand continues to go up, you are going to price people out. So in this cycle, this this one that we've just been through, the one that we're in the bear market of right now, you are you have priced out Western middle class. Before that, you priced out you know third world middle class, and now you've priced out Western middle class. The average Western middle class person can't rub together thirty thousand dollars to put into a speculative investment. And so, as it does this and goes to the next cycle, and the scarcity increases even more, you're going to price out single digit millionaires, and then you're going to price out double digit millionaires, and it will just keep going like that. So. It's not that I'm I think that it is someone's last chance. It is a bunch of people's last chances, which is why I'm even talking about it on YouTube because I don't believe I'll be around in, in it. I don't think anything I'll have to say will be valuable in six or seven years.
it's valuable now for this moment in time. That's a super great way to put it. Um, I like, uh, just as you said that, it kind of gave me a little bit of an epiphany how each cycle it's pricing out a complete new class of people around the world. I've never heard anyone talk about it like that before. It's a brilliant way to uh, kind of frame it. Um, so do you think maybe, uh, what do you think the next cycle could potentially look like? Are you, uh, I've heard you kind of talk about stock to flow in previous uh, interviews. Firstly, maybe what do you think about that model? Do you think it's useful? Do you think it has any use? I have a background in gold as well. And in gold, we use the idea of stock to flow to value gold and understand how hard an asset is. Hmm. So I understand stock to flow from an economic perspective. And then, of course, I, I understand the model, the price model that was created called stock to flow as well for Bitcoin by uh, Plan B on Twitter. Um, I think his initial model is extremely valuable. Hmm. Uh, no model is ever perfect. That's why it's called a model. Um, and, you know, I, I think that it, it is always interesting to see what people think is going to happen to the price, especially very, very smart, intelligent people like Plan B, who's got background in investment banking and private equity and everything else that he's done. Mm -hmm. So it's always interesting for me to see what someone's saying. Do I agree with the stock to flow model? I will say one thing, his very first original model it's on the money. It's on the money. I don't care what the haters say. It's on the money. It's not designed to be specifically on a on a point. But when you look at it like, you know, is it following the path that was laid out in the model? It's on the money. I don't care what the haters say. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And most people are only looking at his uh, latest model. I think that's the one that put uh, Bitcoin's peak at like 288 last year. But like you say, the previous one, it was relatively close. I think his first one predicted- no, it, wasn't, it wasn't relatively close. It, his, his original model predicted a price in this last cycle of 50,000 or mm. 55,000. So yeah, we didn't get the blow off top, but it, it's on the money. Yeah. And there's a lot of people discussing stock to flow recently. So I'm sure they'll like that uh, little, little tidbit there. British, I'd love to transition a little bit more about how you got into property, real estate and stocks overall. I think there's an interesting story there because I think you got introduced to it earlier than most. Uh, when did your journey begin into foraying into markets? So my dad was always into real estate uh, ever since I was young. And one day, I must have been 15, 16, 15 and a half years old, let's say, um, I was watching him negotiate a deal. He was negotiating deals with a, a small group of investors, and they would negotiate the deal and then purchase it amongst the group. And one day he got off the phone and my arrogant ass turned around and said, you know, that looks easy uh, with a smirk on my face. And the best gift he ever gave me was instead of telling me to take a hike, he, he told me, he said, show me if it's that easy, show me. Um, and then I had that visceral feeling of where your mouth has just written a check that your body has no idea how to cash. And I had to figure it out. That's one thing about me. It's like, I think when my back is against the wall, I get focused. A lot of people, some people get panicked, for me, when my back is against the wall, I get very focused. And then so I just started learning what is a mortgage broker? What is a developer? What, why do people buy a property? How do you, what makes a good property deal? What makes a bad property deal? How do you sell a property deal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that led, you know, into my journey into real estate and then stocks after that and then gold after that and then Bitcoin. I love it. Uh, do you remember what year that transition uh, came for you to begin looking into Bitcoin? 2020. I always knew about Bitcoin in, in the periphery, in the periphery, mm. because a lot of people that I'm around were calling Bitcoin a scam for many, many years. And so I always knew about it. And in 2016, 2017, I was sitting with my best friend in a cigar lounge in London and we bought, we, it was during the bull run, right? And we were just mm. like, this thing looks like it's going to go up. Let's just speculate a little bit. Mm. We bought 20 Bitcoin each. Yeah, each hmm. and two weeks later the price doubled and we sold it and paid for our cigars for six months um and then just watched it go up to 20k come back down crash die and then 2020 came around and a friend that i highly respect started talking about bitcoin that he was allocating to bitcoin i was like 
the t-shirt wearing sandal wearing hippies that's one thing but why are you suddenly changing your tune and then he gave me well he told me to to listen to the book uh the bitcoin standard during the pandemic and then that is the book that helped me realize i had fucked up <laughs> It's a great book. It's one of my orange pilling uh, number ones that I give out to people. It's it's kind of weird because right now I, I notice in 2023, everyone wants to try and simplify or, you know, uh, take the work away. I think I still think the Bitcoin standard is the book everyone should read to understand why Bitcoin is important. I think Safer Dean does an amazing job. He also has a, he's also, he was also a gold investor as well. So I think I resonated with him on that. But some people say, you know, it's a little bit too dense and this, that, and the other. And I, and my response to that is you need to get smarter. Hmm. Do the but work. that is, yeah, that is the book that everyone should read. Yeah. I think that's a very uh, underrated opinion as well. Like I think a lot of people say to me, oh, Bitcoin's too hard. Nobody will spend two hours learning how to set up a wallet. And I always challenge that. I say, well, the everyday normally, uh, normie, they normally have to spend at least an hour or two getting their bank account set up. Why can't they spend two hours watching a short tutorial or listening to two hours of the Bitcoin standard? I think it's achievable. I think it's absolutely achievable. But again, people only move when there is fear or greed. Mm. And unfortunately, the average normal person allows themselves to be distracted away from that natural visceral fear or greed that we have at certain moments. So when I listened to the Bitcoin standard and I was walking around the park during the flu season, worldwide flu season that we had, um, I was I I was viscerally scared when Saifedean said the word stock to flow. He didn't even have to explain it because of my many because of my many years of working in investing. The second he just said stock to flow, all of the knowledge just aligned. And I was like, oh, shit, I fucked up. Um, and that was fear for me. Right. And and between hearing that chapter and walking home, I had already opened up my Coinbase application, wired funds into it and bought Bitcoin. But that, that's what happens when people, when you get viscerally scared or viscerally greedy. But the average person is too distracted on YouTube, on, 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 on TikTok, on Instagram, on booty, on cats, on dogs, on whatever else that's going on in the world, rather than on Ukraine, on Putin, on Biden, on Trump, on whatever's going on. Um to allow themselves to feel that fear or greed, but your, your, your body is designed to guide you in the right direction. Uh, and your emotions are designed for that. But a lot of people are so blunted by what's going on. And then, and then you got to look at how medically castrated our society is. Mm. Right. So the normie will get there when fear or greed is allowed to take over. It's a great way to put it. It reminds me uh, the way you just described that feeling about getting Bitcoin like that because of stock to flow. It reminded me listening to Michael Saylor's story as soon as he figured out he needed to buy Bitcoin. I think he bought $400 million worth in a pretty short amount of time. Uh, Hoddle, you speak a lot about the Bitcoin multiplier effect. Uh, I know that people either love it or they get triggered when I talk about the multiplier effect, but I think you talk about some numbers that are even more triggering than myself. So what do you think about the Bitcoin multiplier effect and how does it relate to Bitcoin scarcity and stock to flow? Firstly, I want anyone to anyone who's ever heard of that phrase, the multiplier effect, I want them to know I don't talk about my numbers. I talk about Bank of America's numbers. Right. So Bank of America put a team on trying to figure out how assets work is very is, is very interesting. The price of an asset is set at the margin of the supply. So um, if there is 10 of these lighters on the market, but eight of them are being held by people like me and not up for sale, there the 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 price of an of of this is dependent on the two that are available to sell now if there's 10 buyers they have to bid on the two because the eight are being held so that so the price is set at the margin of the supply and bank of america worked out and put out there that at the peak of the last bull run 
$93 million of cash infusion was pushing up the market price of Bitcoin by 1%. And 1% at the time was $11 billion on a $1.1 trillion market cap. That's a $1 in to $118 increase in the market cap. And so when people tell me that that's impossible, I'm like, well, Bank of America has put this out. So let's assume you believe as a Twitter, doom and gloom, boomer, $1,000 net worth, a $10 a month DCA gang member, that Bank of America is absolutely stupid. Let's just take that arrogant position and say Bank of America and their trillions of AUM and their people on their team are absolutely stupid. Is it are they 50? Is it 50% of Bank of America said? Mm -hmm. Is it 56 times? It's still higher than any other asset we've ever had because the supply is completely fixed. So the multiplier effect is just that. It's what does one dollar going into the market equal uh in the market cap increase? Because it's never one for one. Hmm. It's a beautiful, unique thing about Bitcoin. Uh it's the only asset around the world that's completely fixed and it's so easy to take self-custody of, uh, which is why I think we both see Bitcoin going a lot higher in the future. Uh, is there a target for you in the future, say in 10 or 20 years, what do you think Bitcoin could potentially be worth? I, I think we hit $5 million, which is only a $100 trillion market cap. Now, when you say $5 million per Bitcoin, it sounds crazy. But when I say a $100 trillion market cap, for the entire Bitcoin market, when stocks is US stocks is $140, $50 trillion. Uh, US bond market is $120, $130 trillion. Real estate worldwide is, is $330 trillion. It starts becoming more reasonable, right? I'm saying that in 10 years, Bitcoin will be worth $100 trillion as an entire market cap. And that will still be less than the entire bond market, the entire US stock market, and worldwide real estate. Think about that. I'm not even saying that it surpasses these assets and people think I'm crazy. You and I both, brother, they think I'm crazy as well. But, uh, we'll tell the listener, you can send your hate mail in the comments of the video down below. Uh, now, something else that's really kind of piquing lots of people's interest right now is uh, something that Willy Woo said. So for anyone who missed it, I believe he was on stage at a, a What Bitcoin Did event in Australia, and he was just talking about why nation states might potentially try to suppress the price of Bitcoin uh, in the futures market. And you recorded a beautiful video about it, uh, British. I'm just going to give you the mic. Uh, what do you think about the potential of nation states trying to suppress the price of Bitcoin through the paper markets? I I, res I respect uh, Willie's opinion, which is why I did um, the rebuttal. If I didn't respect his opinion, I wouldn't have done the rebuttal video. I just completely and utterly disagree with what he said. Because if a nation state was to try and suppress the price of Bitcoin by using the paper markets to do so, it would, not, it would have to be the United States, right? So we can take his in my opinion, doom and gloom, fear mongering and reduce it down to one country. Why only the United States? Because it is the biggest capital markets in the world, right? All of these, you would have to have, for example, the US uh, S&P 500 is 40 times bigger than the UK stock market, the FTSE 100, mm. right? It's We're not talking like double, we're, we're talking huge amounts of dollars bigger. And so, it could only be the US markets that it could use to do this with. That being said, in order to create any aligned manipulation of Bitcoin, you would have to violate every commodities trading rule, every securities trading rule, and every rule that's been put in place to stabilize markets in the US, which makes the US markets the number one capital markets in the world. So you'd have to give up the integrity of the US capital markets in order to do that. You would also need political alignment because you probably need to print a bunch of capital in order to actually place those short positions. So you now need political alignment on both sides. You need to then accept that you're going to violate the, 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 the standing of the U.S. American capital markets, which are the best in the world. You then need to violate every single law that's been put into place to, to stabilize those capital markets. 
So it's easy to say that there is a possibility that this can happen. But if the probability is 0.01%, why do we need to talk about it? Mm-hmm. But I think it does a great, great job at, you know, gaining clicks and subscribers. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. But I'm just I'm just happy that after a big hiatus, you know, I, I Willie didn't stop tweeting for a week after my rebuttal video. So I'm happy I got Willie to start talking about Bitcoin again. That's that's important. Because I think his voice is, his voice is valuable. Mm. Yeah, me too. I certainly agree. Uh, the more people talking about Bitcoin, the better. Uh, and that kind of brings me to a place in the podcast that I want to talk a little bit more about you because you've been talking a lot about Bitcoin on YouTube recently. How are you finding it? And uh, what's kind of driving you to make so many videos about Bitcoin? Mate, it's crazy. <laughs> let's, let's just, <laughs> I, I, if, I don't know what's happening. All I'm doing is, you know, thinking about Bitcoin, which I do, getting angry, about whatever I'm thinking about and turning on the camera, right? <laughs> like that's basically it. I don't have any fancy editing. I don't, I don't do I there's no guess. It's it's just me and a camera talking about everything I've learned in my life and how it applies to Bitcoin and how I think it will apply to the future of Bitcoin. And people are are loving it so far. Um my main goal isn't really to get views or or whatever else. I think the views are important for the for the end goal, but it's the view isn't the goal. I would much rather a channel where I had a thousand views a video rather than fifteen to twenty thousand views. But every single one of those thousand views was a whole coiner. Mm. I would much rather that. You know, um, so that's my that's my perspective. I love it. It's amazing. I'm glad you know the 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 content is is touching people, and I'm glad people are understanding Bitcoin more. And from my perspective of it, I really respect the fact that they're giving me the time of day. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I hope we just get more people to one Bitcoin before this thing runs away. It's a beautiful message. I nearly want to end it right there because it's such a beautiful place to end the podcast. Let's orange peel more people on Bitcoin. British, is there anywhere else people can find you online? Just go to the most well-known website on earth, youtube.com and type in (laughs) British Huddle. Done. Thank you so much, British. And I'll see you all in the next interview. Pleasure. So if you made it this far into today's video with British HODL, I reckon you're going to absolutely love another video that I recorded looking at the Bitcoin multiplier effect, but also looking at BlackRock's bullish portfolio allocation recommendation when they said they believe that you should put 84.9% of your money into Bitcoin. If you want to check out the bullish video we recorded on that topic where I showed you the maths behind why a $117 million Bitcoin is not only conservative, but it's possible in today's dollars i will put a link to that video on screen for you guys right there and with all that said let me know in the comments down below whether you think british and i are just a little bit too bullish let me know what you want us to make a video on next and with all that said i hope you enjoy the video i popped up on screen right there and i will see you all in the next one